right. All right, for my group getting online on Facebook, you have the link on a previous Facebook post that has the handouts for last night and tonight. You can download them from there. Everybody just coming in, there's a handout, a prayer card for night two. It's on this side of the table. If you need the prayer handouts from night one, they're on this side. And in the middle is the prayer sheet that we're using. You guys from night one already have it. But if there's a copies up there in the middle. Online for you guys who are just joining us, there's a link on a Facebook post right under the video feed um, on a separate post that has your handouts from last night and tonight for you to download if you'd like to pray with us with those and follow along.
right, guys, for everybody just coming in, there's a second night's handout in the new prayer card on the table. There's a packet from last night if you want to copy of that one and you didn't pick one up. And then the middle uh, pile is the prayer handout that we're going to use every night. So if you take one tonight, please bring it back with you the rest of the mission. Guys, again, for those who just came up online, y'all have a um, post right before the video from earlier today that has the link to all of the handouts from last night and tonight. So you can download those and follow along if you like. Facebook audience, can somebody respond and let me know if y'all can hear me, please? Mic check for the Facebook viewing group. Can y'all hear me? Good evening, everyone. I'm surprised that so many have um, fared the weather to come out tonight. So, I guess we did something right last night, right? We ought to come back. So, amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we'll go ahead and go ahead and get started tonight. So, um, just a few recaps um, for our resources from last night. You should have received, um, you know, your handout from last night. Um, raise your hand if you're joining us for the first time tonight. All right, just a couple. So we do have the handouts from last night and they're labeled um, for night number one, dream number one, right here in the table um, in the back. And then of course, uh, does everyone have their handout for tonight? All right, great. And then just a couple of things I didn't get a chance to mention um, before we dismissed last night. Um, last night with your handouts, you should have gone home with an examination of conscience um, for marriages. And so I don't know if, um, you know, y'all had a chance to look at that or not, but it was a particular examination of conscience for married couples. Um, it was from the USCCB, the United States Catholic Conference Bishops um, website. And I just thought it was really well done and gave um, kind of just um, enlightening questions, um, kind of vocational um, reflection questions on, on the gift of marriage. So um, I actually have one I use for the priesthood too. There's a special um, examination of conscience um, for priests that ask particular questions that pertaining to priests and kind of their fidelity to the priesthood ministry. So I think, you know, as we look at Advent and, and making an Advent confession, that's one of the worthwhile things we can do. Um, sometimes we kind of feel like we're just confessing the same things, that same kind of examination of the Ten Commandments. One neat little way um, to kind of open the, um, broaden our, our reflection of our examination of conscience is to reflect on the gift of our vocation. Whether it's a mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, or our, our work, our ministry, you know, and what's the fidelity of me and the gift of my vocation? And that's a, an area that can open up our confessions and give us, um, you know, a broader scope um, in our confessions. So I'm glad you got that resource last night. And then you got The Guardian, The Redeemer by John Paul II. 
on last night also. It's my favorite reflection on St. Joseph by Pope John Paul II. So I just wanted to touch base on those um, resources from last night. Um, today we'll begin. We have a new prayer. Um, each of these prayers are um, you know, individual for each of our dreams of Joseph. And so kind of on um, this prayer, this is kind of a reference to, um, we kind of want to keep the theme of um, kind of going out into the desert um, for tonight. So um, this one's just kind of supposed to appear a little bit kind of a riddick and just kind of like we're going out into the desert. And so if you want to join me, I will go ahead and get started by offering our prayer for dream number two. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All together, Joseph, son of Jacob, you were betrayed by your brothers and sold into slavery in Egypt. You underwent a dark night of suffering and were restored by God in abundance. Saint Joseph, you were sent by an angel in a dream into Egypt to save the life of your son, the savior of the world. Joseph, son of Jacob, and Joseph, spouse of Mary, draw us into this Advent season, this holy time set apart to prepare the way for the Lord. Draw us into our own desert experience where we may encounter the freedom of God's love. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So yeah, that'll be our, our theme for tonight. It'll be um, going out into the desert. Of course, as we know, um, dream number two uh, of St. Joseph is when an angel once again speaks to him in a dream. I'm um, commanding him um, to bring the Holy Family to Egypt. So obviously, um, Joseph is going to um, bring us to Egypt um, tonight, and we're going to journey into the desert um, with Joseph. And so the second dream of St. Joseph, we find in, once again, Matthew's Gospel, is where we're going to find all four dreams. The second dream is chapter 2 of Matthew's Gospel, verses 13 through 15. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there till I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. So once again, that very last line, we see Matthew the evangelist mention that the going forth, the angel speaking to Joseph in the second dream to go to Egypt, the Holy Family, was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt have I called my son. And if we look down um, to the third bullet point, we see that there was a prophecy by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, it reads, Behold, the Lord goes down into Egypt, seated atop a swift cloud, and the idols of Egypt shall fall. So there's actually a prophecy in the Old Testament that the Lord, the Son of God, the Messiah, would go to Egypt. So how neat it is that this prophecy is fulfilled in the second dream with Joseph. And we'll see that um, throughout tonight and throughout each one of our nights during this um, Advent retreat, that there are these um, little prophecies that we may have never even heard of um, in the Old Testament, but yet these little movements that oftentimes don't make sense to us of Jesus and the Gospels or don't seem to have great importance, oftentimes are prophetic fulfillments um, from the Old Testament. And it's just um, something to really stand in awe and wonder, that the Bible is written over centuries written by different people over centuries, and somehow it all comes to this um, prophetic fulfillment and this um, prophetic kind of cohesion of our salvation story. And once again, it's just a real reminder that the Holy Spirit is, um, you know, driving St. Joseph, is driving the story of salvation, and that truly that the Word of God is of the Lord. Now, I don't know how familiar y'all are with the Church Fathers, I'm sure you um, have some familiarity with the church fathers. I'm sure at times in a homily or reading a book or listening to a podcast, 
you'll hear a speaker mention, you know, one of the church fathers. Well, what do we mean, um, you know, as priests and, and, you know, presenters when we speak of the church fathers? We're speaking of holy men and women living in the first centuries of the church, namely, you know, maybe from the first century through the fifth or sixth, you know, maybe the seventh century. And, And why do we uphold the church fathers in a special way? Because they were in close proximity to the historical life of Jesus Christ. It's a little difficult for us, 2,000 years removed, to make claims about what happened in Jesus' life, right? Because it's been 2,000 years. So we're kind of loosely going off of different writings we found and archaeological evidence, but it's a little thin because a lot of time has passed. But we're so blessed in our church tradition to have been able to pass on some original manuscripts from different fathers of the church that we're able to read today from these men who accounted for the life of Christ that were much, much, much closer to this actual historical time when he walked the face of this earth. And so that's why we give more um, credibility to the quotes of the church fathers because of their closer proximity to the historical life of Jesus Christ. And in my own personal research for this Advent mission on the four dreams of Joseph, the church fathers have been my guide. And it's probably the most fun part of my research. The church fathers have given us insights that I would never have thought of on my own into these four dreams. And perhaps in none of the nights more than tonight, there's going to be two quotes from the church fathers that just gave me brand new insights into the second dream of Joseph and why the Holy Family went to Egypt and God's providence for our salvation history and the story of Jesus Christ. So I'd like to read um, this first quote from one of the fathers. Um, It's our first bullet point under our Roman numeral second dream, the first bullet point, beginning quote. Go into the land of Egypt. For just like a doctor, the Lord went down to Egypt that he might visit it as it languished in error. Not that he might stay there, For at first blush, it seems as if he went down to Egypt in flight from Herod. The fact is that he went in order to put to flight the demons of Egypt's error. Do you see that it was not to escape death that he went down into Egypt, but that he might eradicate their deadly idols? For this is the only time that the Lord traveled to Egypt. So once again, this church father, I'm sure has in mind the prophecy of Isaiah 19.1, that the Lord will go down to Egypt to dispel of their idols. And he's saying that this is the only time that Jesus went to Egypt was as a child. Another one of the church fathers made a beautiful comment. He said, it wasn't so much Joseph that led the Holy Family to Egypt, but it was the Lord that led Joseph to go to Egypt. And it's so beautiful. We think of the three active years of the ministry of Jesus Christ when he turned age 30 and 30, 33 years old, that he lived out those years of ministry before his crucifixion. But how cool is it that we see here from the fathers that Jesus being sent with the Holy Family and Joseph to the land of Egypt was already the beginning of his ministry, that Jesus was already at work dispelling the idols of Egypt. And where else did we see Jesus kind of go out into the desert? Was it not at the beginning of his public ministry? Was it not in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus spent 40 days in the desert? And since we keep in mind in that season of Lent, those 40 days that Jesus spent in the desert, before beginning his public ministry, well, here we have an Advent. Jesus going with the Holy Family to Egypt, also going out to the desert at the beginning of his life. In a sense, it's in the desert that oftentimes we overcome our demons. It's in the desert that oftentimes we overcome those evils in our lives. You may have heard of the Desert Fathers. In a sense, before um, St. Benedict came along and established the first um, monasteries um, in the church, you had different men and women who would journey out to the desert um, to live a nomadic-type life, a life of um, purification, a life where 
the silence of the desert um, allowed them to um, come face to face with their own demons and their own sins and their own pride and their own lust and their own ways of the flesh so that they could overcome those things and, and grow in purity and holiness. And, and so that's the experience um, that the desert um, allows for us. And so as we enter into the um, season of Advent, you know, once again, you know, Advent is like a little Lent. You know, Advent is a little um, penitential season. And as we go through the season of Lent, it, it's good for us to reflect, is there an area of sacrifice um, that I can have on um, this Advent? And there's an area that perhaps I can add a little extra prayer. In a sense, just like we do during Lent. You know, perhaps um, during Lent you um, make a few resolutions, you know, maybe to let go of caffeinated beverages or, or to spend some more time in prayer or, or to wake up a little bit early and pray. Well, we can do the same in Advent. Advent is a shorter season, and of course we're a lot more busy with preparing for the holidays. Our penances don't have to be as um, strong in measure as they are during Lent. But yet it would be amiss if we go through the whole um, Advent season um, without taking um, any penance. And um, one penance I'm not prepared to take right now, though, is sweating. So I'm starting to get hot and sweaty. So I'm going to ask Miss Jessica um, to go drop the AC. And y'all can deal with it. And if you're cold, then that's your penance. <laughs> Don't you like how that works? I love how that works. I think it's brilliant. Go ahead and put it on. You got it, sister. I'm in charge. Put on the jacket. Always bring a jacket to church. Always be ready. So anywho, coming back to the point. So Advent is a small penitential season. Now what I'll share with you, what I'm personally um, doing this Advent, I always try to um, take a day of prayer, kind of like a desert day, kind of a day of um, quiet and solitude before I enter into the season of Advent. And so I did that, um, you know, this year. Kind of, you know, Advent had began right after Thanksgiving. Well, right before Thanksgiving, I took a day of silence and prayer. And, and the one invitation um, I felt from the Lord was, was to um, wake up at 4 a.m. Um, more often and, and spend some extra time in prayer, um, maybe praying an extra rosary. So um, that's what um, I've been doing this Advent. Not doing it so much this week because our mission's at 7 p.m. and, you know, it's keeping me up a little bit later. But I had a great week last week. The first few days of Advent, getting up early and you know, I think Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, I got an extra rosary in because I got up a little bit earlier. So that was a great um, invitation for me personally um, into Advent. As I made a little sacrifice of, of a little bit less sleep, it also gave me an opportunity um, for a little more prayer, um, for an extra rosary. And so that was my main invitation I have felt on um, this Advent. Um, what's yours? You know, have you had a chance to pray about that? Have you considered a little sacrifice or a little extra prayer on um, this Advent? So that's one thing I wanted to lift up. And that's one way we can respond um, to this reflection by the fathers of the church. That with Joseph and the Holy Family, we go into Egypt to overcome the idols of our lives. We can do that with a little bit more prayer and a little bit more sacrifice. Thank you, Jessica. It's feeling great. Yes, thank you. It wasn't just me. I started counting the number of people waving themselves, and I said, oh, I'm doing it. <laughs> I wait for validation. Okay, now we're going to look at a second quote from other church fathers. Um, this one we're more familiar with, St. John Chrysostom, um, nicknamed the Golden Tongue. St. John Chrysostom was a prolific um, church father, kind of like an early Augustine. And he probably wrote the most of um, any of the fathers of the church I researched um, in presentation for this um, mission on the four dreams of Joseph. And so I could include all of his quotes, but I thought this one really um, gave us a new insight into the second dream of Joseph to bring the Holy Family to Egypt. Beginning quote, But why was the Christ child sent into Egypt? The text makes this clear. He was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt have I called my son. From that point onward, we see that the hope of salvation would be proclaimed to the whole world. Babylon and Egypt represent the whole world. Even when they were engulfed in ungodliness, God signified that he intended to correct and amend both Babylon and Egypt. God wanted humanity to expect his bounteous gifts the world over, 
So he called from Babylon the wise men and sent to Egypt the holy family. Once again, we see another prophetic fulfillment, this time from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Now of Egypt did I call my son. And we also saw the evangelist uh, Matthew um, refer to that in chapter 2, verse 15. So how neat it is that we have two prophetic fulfillments in the second dream of Jesus. From Hosea and from Isaiah, both gave a prophecy that the Messiah would go to Egypt, and for different reasons. But it's just really neat, um, the great mystery of the way God, you know, weaves together um, this divine tapestry of the, um, the scriptures and our salvation history. And, and we see here a different reason for the Holy Family to go to Egypt. The first reason we saw was for him to overcome the idols of Egypt. But this reason is entirely different. This reason is a coming together, a bringing together of all the nations of the world. Is that not what Christ came for? To establish his kingdom, not just for America or for Italy or for you know, Rome or just particular places, but for all nations, right? We're not just, you know, um, Americans or just one group of people, right? But we're of all stripes and colors, ethnicities and backgrounds. We're all God's children and one great human family. And Christ came for us all, for all peoples and all nations. And John Christum helps us to see that that's symbolized by Egypt and Babylon. Remember, the world in Jesus' time was a lot smaller, right? They don't... You know, Christopher Columbus hasn't, you know, sailed to um, America yet, right? They don't know about the new world, and just the known world at that time is a lot smaller. So from their preview, kind of like from the east of Babylon to Egypt, that's kind of encompasses the known world at the time. And so we see that John Christopher mentions, surrounding the birth of Christ, that from the known world you have the wise men come from the east, from Babylon, and then you're going to have Jesus with the Holy Family go to Egypt. So in a way, even as a child in his infancy, Christ is touching all nations. And so in a sense, he's signaling that he's coming to bring together all nations. There's a little book I'm reading right now. Um, we had a little Advent day of prayer and reflection. And um, Bishop always gives us a, a Christmas gift for all the priests. And, um, and I sell a Christmas card every year. And so this year, oh, it's always a book. And, and this year, um, it's a little book called Let Us Dream um, by Pope Francis, called A, a Path to a Better Future. And it's um, a really be beautiful book. It's a Pope Francis' first um, writing that's not an official um, church document, um, like an apostolic exhortation or encyclical or a teaching document. But it's a personal um, reflection on COVID-19. And so it's kind of his 200-page um, homily on, from his viewpoint as the Holy Father and kind of in touch with all the countries throughout the world, how COVID-19 has affected them and his kind of pastoral guidance and um, reflection on, on God's um, you know, word that he may want to share with us in response to um, how the world's been affected by the pandemic. And in it, among many other um, beautiful things, of course, um, in true Pope Francis style, he draws attention to the depressed, um, to the outliers, and to the minority and the forgotten. And um, in particular, he highlights a few different um, groups. I just kind of wanted to bring up, you know, his book, um, Letters Dream, his response to the COVID-19 pandemic, because, you know, it's the best of Pope Francis, where he really helps to draw our attention um, to, you know, those who are marginalized and, and those who are poor and those who go without. And I sense I think that's part of what the second dream of Joseph is doing, um, with Jesus touching all nations. And so just kind of a little um, diversion here. Pope Francis just touched my heart um, the other night when I was reading this. And he was just highlighting different groups of people that we forget about. Um, one group he highlights is the, the Rohingya. The Rohingya is an entire nation of people, they're not their own nation, they don't have a sovereign nation, but their entire group of people, numbering about 600,000 um, outside of Bangladesh. Um, they're a Muslim minority um, that's kind of um, 
not been allowed back into India, but not been allowed um, back into their other neighboring nation. And they're actually a people without a country. No one wants them. And it's a whole people, um, a, you know, approaching a million people that, that no one will accept into their country. And no one's supporting them. Um, you know, from the West, it's just this entire people that are in these type of um, refugee camps and they have no home. I mean, highlights another group um, called the um, Uyghurs, and, and they're kind of the group we've heard about. We, we kind of know that, you know, in, in China there's um, some different types of, you know, camps where some um, Muslim minorities are being, you know, held, um, perhaps against their will, and he kind of names them also, and that kind of um, injustice there. And then he also names the Yazidi, which is a religious group um, that was um, heavily persecuted um, by ISIS. Um, in these past um, several years. So I kind of like wanted to mention those groups because each one of those three groups we may have never heard of, but they've been under you know, great persecution and with very little help in this global community that we live in where we would be so able to help one another. I just kind of wanted to highlight that because that should be part of our Advent reflection. Just as the Holy Family went to Egypt and, and Christ was able to touch Egypt and the wise men from Babylon, he's able to kind of touch all nations. Remember, Christ comes um, to establish a kingdom of peace, right? We hear it uh, time and time again in the Gospels that Jesus did not just come for who? For the Jews, but he also came for who? The Gentiles, not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles, right? For all peoples. Christ came for the entire human family, for all peoples. And so if we're looking for another little um, sacrifice we can make this Advent, during the Christmas and holiday season, it could be a financial tithe. Maybe we could donate to the um, Christians persecuted um, in the Middle East, in Palestine. As we know, oftentimes, the um, representatives of the um, Christians there you know, come with the wood carvings, right? The olive wood carvings during Christmas to sell. Because they're so persecuted and they need so much help. So perhaps we could tithe to you know, a, a minority group or a group in need, um, locally or nationally, internationally, and another thing we can do is remember them in our prayers, you know? Um, these are things that we don't hear about, you know, on CNN or, or Fox News. You know, we just kind of hear about what's happening locally, but we don't hear about um, the true suffering going on in so many different um, corners and pockets of the world. And so maybe, um, instead of watching some of the um, common um, drama on TV, maybe we could um, make a little extra effort to learn what's going on out there in the world. Maybe we could grab Pope Francis's book and, and read that, let him be a guide to us. And we could pray for those people. Um, there may be four away and we may feel like, you know, what can I do for them? We may not even be able to offer them um, financial aid or, or other types of um, temporal aid, but we can pray for them. We can pray for Christ. Christ shows us that he came to overcome idols and he came to unite all nations. I mean, he shows us that at the very beginning of his life, by going to Egypt. Um, so let us pray. Let us pray for the kingdom of God, which is what? It's a kingdom of peace to be established in the world this Christmas. He's the newborn king. And that innocent um, child in the, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that innocent child um, born in the manger in the cave, came to draw all peoples. And, and all peoples came to him. The shepherds came to him. The poor came to him. You know, the noblemen from the east came to him. He came to draw us all to him through the gift of his innocence and his love. And we hear in Matthew's Gospel again in the Beatitudes, when the Beatitudes says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Sons of God are peacemakers. We are called to be sons of God in Christ Jesus, the Son of God. So this holiday season, let us be peacemakers. You can flip the page. How diggity dog, it's 7.30. You want to know that I have a little note right here? It says 30 minutes? And my goal was to be at this point at 7.30? Guys, we're on the minute. Good. Praise the Lord. All right, so we're just going to keep moving forward, okay, y'all? All right, Roman numeral three. 
the call of Abraham and the promise of a great nation. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Genesis chapter 26, verses 4 through 5. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and will give to your descendants all these lands. And by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge. All of us are familiar with the call of Abraham. Abraham is our father in the faith. Just in case, sometimes we uh, may not be exactly certain about the historical timeline of our salvation history. Let us remember, Abraham is the beginning. He's the first guy to receive, you know, Yahweh to speak to him. Um, you know, Abraham begins our monotheistic faith, um, the, the faith in, you know, the Israelite God um, that precurses our Christian faith. And, and in fact, Abraham was a pagan at first, right? Abraham encounters God and God speaks to him. We don't ever, ever think about this, but Abraham himself had a conversion, a, a conversion um, you know, to Yahweh. Um, he was a pagan, but then he converted and becomes the father of many nations. Now the reason why I wanted to bring in Abraham though is because um, where I'm headed is to um, Joseph of the Old Testament. And that's kind of where we're going to park it for the next 30 minutes. Um, because one of my favorite stories in the Bible is kind of the story of um, Joseph and, you know, the um, Technicolor Code, remember? Um, you know, Joseph and his 11 brothers. Um, Joseph was the, um, you know, the 11th brother, the favored one of his father, um, Jacob. And then um, Jacob's father is Isaac, whose father is Abraham. And so I just wanted to start with Abraham to get us to Joseph. And we're going to take a brief detour with Jacob here. Together, I'm just, not together, but just invite you to listen. I'm going to read um, Genesis chapter 28, verses 1 and following. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your descendants. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I do not know it. So once again, Jacob, along with his own um, you know, Rachel and his wives, they're going to be the father of the 12. that will become the 12 nations of, or the 12 tribes of Israel. They'll fulfill the prophecy to Abraham to be a father of many nations. But this little um, pericope here, I mention because it's a dream. And so it's not only Joseph that receives these dreams, but here we have another example in the Old Testament of um, Jacob dreaming in the middle of the night. And in this dream, he sees a ladder ascending to heaven. This is a great image for us. For Advent. Because remember, we spoke about Advent as a little Lent. And since the church fathers throughout the tradition, the Christian tradition of um, prayer, has always held up Jacob's ladder of ascent as a beautiful image to contemplate of us trying to ascend to heaven, to climb this ladder to heaven. And there is a, a great history of sacred art um, devoted to this image of Jacob's ladder. And it kind of shows Jacob's ladder ascending from the pits of hell through earth and the heavens to the, the heavens. It kind of depicts the angels coming from heaven to strengthen and support the souls ascending this ladder to heaven and, and the demons coming from um, the fires of hell coming to try to pull down those souls. In a sense, that's where we're at. We're, we're caught in the middle of this journey to heaven. In a sense, you know, every time we enter into these um, graced seasons, these holy seasons set aside Lent and Advent, God's kind of calling us to take the next step on the ladder to heaven, 
to kind of ring out to the next rung, in a sense. You know, one image that comes to me when I think about the um, prayer life and the spiritual life and our kind of journeying with the Lord and taking the next step on the spiritual journey. Um, you know, how many of y'all have like been to Colorado? Have y'all been into the mountains? I suppose everyone, you know, traveled to the mountains. So you ever like, you know, travel to, um, you know, Colorado and, and you're approaching the Rocky Mountains and, you know, you're, you're driving in your vehicle and your car and, and you look out and, you know, you, you see this beautiful mountain range and it's just gorgeous and you see multiple peaks and some are high and some are low and some are in between hills and mountains and they say, you know, it's beautiful. And then, um, you know, you get a little bit closer and you're like, yeah, I could walk up that. Yeah. You ever try walking up one of them? How'd that go for you? It's this big down the interstate, but when you get there, it's a whole other story, right? That mountain looks like, I could do that. But what happens when you actually start climbing a mountain, or let's not say a mountain, let's just say a little hill. Well, when you get up in the trees and everything, you can hardly see, you know, 10 feet in front of you. That's how the spiritual journey is, right? A lot of times in our journey with God and our journey with life, we're like, I can't see 10 feet in front of me. I don't even know where I'm going. It's not always a nice little path for you, right? And then when you're climbing up a hill, you have to set goals, right? And you kind of just see the next little overhang, right? And it's just like, you know, I'm going to get to that overhang. So you get to that next little overhang, you're like, whew, got here. And you look up like, oh, I thought the top of the mountain was going to be here. But guess what? When you end the hill, you don't see the top of the mountain. You just see the next tree in front of you, right? And you just go to the next overhang, and the next overhang, and the next overhang. They may be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 overhangs until you get to the top of the peak, right? That's what the spiritual journey is, right? All of us can attest to that as being true. All of us have been there. In this kind of journey of life with the Lord, always asking for Him to, to guide us on that journey. Sometimes we plateau in the spiritual life. Sometimes we just kind of, whew, just take a breath and like, Lord, I'm good. And that's a great place to be. And when we're at that place, let us rest. We need to rest sometimes. You know, if you need a rest, rest. If you've been too busy, rest. We've, we've spoken about, you know, resting during Advent, letting go of the noise. But at the same time, our God is a dynamic God. And our relationship with God can never be static. It's always moving forward or backwards. We hear scripture say, if you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Be either hot or cold. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, I'd rather you be moving backwards than be sitting still. He's like, I can't work with anyone sitting still. Of course, he wants us moving forward, but he's saying, you know, be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. And that was a scripture my own pastor growing up would, would always mention. You know, be either hot or cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. But in a sense, the church and her liturgical cycle kind of gives us a roadmap, a trail for climbing up that, that spiritual mountain. And at times we do have to plateau and we do have to rest. But Advent and Lent are seasons for us to say, all right, Lord, where have I been? Where am I going? What's the next little rung on the ladder to heaven I want to grab? What's the next little plateau I want to reach. You know, I was a runner in high school, and when you're um, running a long distance race, you know, you always kind of want to say, I'm going to catch up with the next guy in front of me. And you give a little extra effort, you catch up with them, then you just kind of plateau and get used to that pace. Be like, okay, I got this. I can hang with this. Then once you catch your breath, you go, ah, but I don't want to stay here. This isn't good enough. I want to catch that guy now. That should be the spiritual journey. We don't have to push ourselves too hard, right? Or else, you know, we may overdo it. But whenever we kind of plateau and we're kind of like, okay, I can do this, we should start looking at what the next step is. And that's what the holy seasons of Advent and Lent are for. That's why we make those special resolutions so we can take the next step.
All right, guys, Roman number five. This is where we're going to um, take it home tonight. Joseph, son of Jacob. So there's some really neat parallels between St. Joseph and, and the Holy Family and Joseph, um, son of Jacob, um, Joseph of the Old Testament. As, as we mentioned, you know, Abraham bore forth Isaac, who bore forth Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Joseph was the 11th son. So let's look at some of the um, comparison and contrast, some of the similarities between the Joseph of the New Testament and the Joseph of the Old Testament. First off, fun fact, both Josephs have the same name of their daddy, Jacob. So we knew that in the Old Testament, Joseph's father is Jacob, Genesis 37, we find out about that. But did you know that in Matthew's Gospel, in the genealogy that opens the first chapter of Matthew's Gospel, that it names Jacob as the father of Joseph, um, father of Jesus, spouse of Mary. So fun fact, they have the same father, Jacob. And so we see a sign and symbol there that, you know, Jacob was the father of the 12 sons that became the 12 nations, the many nations of Israel prophesied in Abraham. Well, you know, who is J Joseph, you know, the father of, in the New Testament, uh, of Jesus, who, who is who? The king of nations, right? And so once again, going back to what we said earlier, that Jesus came to bring forth all nations, we even see that prophetic fulfillment in Joseph himself, that he was meant to be the father of Jesus, that Jesus was meant to have the role of bringing together all nations, just like we saw with, father, with Joseph, son of Jacob, in the Old Testament. Another thing, we see here that Joseph in the Old Testament was in the royal patriarchal line of Abraham. You know, Israel didn't have kings yet, right? It wasn't until after the period of the judges that Israel had its first kings. But before that, Israel had what? They had kind of patriarchs or fathers in the faith and in their leadership. And Joseph is in that direct line of Abraham, kind of a royal patriarchal line. And then what we're gonna focus in on tomorrow night for the third dream, we're gonna really be diving in tomorrow night into the genealogy of Joseph, St. Joseph, and his true calling in the royal line of King David, and how Christ also fulfills that as king. And so we see that both Joseph and the Old and New Testament were both in royal lines. The big thing that we can you know, touch upon tonight is, we know in the story of Joseph um, in the Old Testament that he was enslaved also um, in Egypt. And so allow me for a moment just to kind of recap on the story of, of Joseph, um, son of Jacob in the Old Testament. As we know, um, Joseph was a favorite child of his father Jacob, because he was one of the youngest ones, and he was of um, Rachel. But then, you know, what happened was the other brothers um, became jealous. We, we all know the infamous Technicolor coat that, you know, Jacob gave his son Joseph a special coat, and that just was the last straw um, for the other brothers. And so they devised a plan, and, and they brought Joseph um, into the desert, where they actually sought to, to take the, his life. Um, but one of the brothers stepped in and, you know, was able to persuade them not to. So um, their compromise um, was, was to throw him into a pit and, and to leave him um, in the desert. But then there was a caravan that, that came by, um, headed to Egypt to sell goods to Egypt, and they come across Joseph in the pit. So they raise him out of the pit and they um, kind of, you know, sell him as an indenture type servant. And then what happened was, um, one of the other similarities between St. Joseph and Joseph in the Old Testament is their purity. They were both um, pure, righteous men. And, and we see um, this little story we may forget about, so I'll refresh our memories. But we see in Genesis that Joseph is kind of sold as an indentured servant to um, one of the royal guards of you know, a well-to-do um, family. You know, the father was one of the guards for the Pharaoh. And what happens is, um, Joseph proves to be a very good servant, very knowledgeable, very um, able, and very well liked. But what's not good is that um, the Roman guard, his name is Potiphar, often has to um, you know, go to work and serve the Pharaoh, and his um, wife is left at home, and his wife falls in love with Joseph. And Joseph wanted nothing to do with it. He was a, a pure man. 
But his wife um, made advances upon Joseph. And Joseph immediately um, deflected and said no and maintained his purity. But Potiphar's wife became enraged um, by the rejection. And so when her husband came home, she um, made it look as if um, she had been, you know, as if Joseph had forced himself upon her. And so um, she convinced everyone that that was the truth. And so Joseph was then thrown into the prison of Pharaoh, on the prison of Pharaoh's guards. And so just to recap, that was the story through Potiphar's wife of how Joseph became um, imprisoned um, in Egypt. And then, of course, we see that, you know, the Holy Family is exiled into Egypt. Of course, both Joseph shared in poverty. We know that when Joseph and Mary went to present Jesus in the temple, that they only had the turtle doves and not a lamb to offer for the sacrifice, that they were poor. You can imagine that having been exiled into Egypt, returning to Nazareth, that St. Joseph may have been a great carpenter, but due to circumstances, never really had an opportunity to probably have a better job as a carpenter, never being in a good, healthy town for employment. So we can see their poverty there. We know that both Joseph's um, had dreams. And so allow me to recount some of the dreams for you that Joseph in the Old Testament um, had. And so when um, Joseph in the Old Testament was in Pharaoh's prison, um, you can't make this up, up okay? Um, this is, the scriptures have every genre and every um, story of life. Um, there's no greater book than the Bible. And so Joseph is in um, Pharaoh's prison. And Pharaoh's chief um, butler and Pharaoh's chief baker are thrown into prison. And so Joseph is commanded to tend to Pharaoh's chief butler and baker. And so the chief butler and baker are not happy to be in prison. The scriptures don't tell us why they're there. But um, the scriptures tell us that one day um, Joseph comes out and he sees both the chief baker and butler um, are very um, pensive. They're very nervous. And Joseph was very caring. Even in prison, he kept a genital spirit and he was concerned for their well-being. And he asked, why are you, you know, bothered today? And both of them said, we had a dream last night that has left us very anxious. And Joseph says, well, um, tell me your dream and I shall interpret it. And, and so the chief um, butler shares, I dreamed of three branches of three clusters of grapes and the grapes were pressed into a chalice and I handed Pharaoh the chalice from which he drank. And Joseph interprets it and he says, in three days you will be restored by Pharaoh and you will be once again serving him at table. So when the chief baker saw that the chief butler had a favorable dream interpretation, he said, oh, well, Joseph, let me share with you my dream, hoping for a favorable interpretation. So the chief baker says, I dreamed, and there were three food baskets on top of my head that I was carrying, and the upper one had food and bread, and many birds and crows came down and ate from the food. And Joseph says, let me interpret that dream for you. Um, in three days, You'll be called forth um, by Pharaoh, and he will behead you. And the birds will come and um, pluck out your eyes and, and so on. And so, um, yeah, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, Lord have mercy, only in the Bible. But the scripture continues in Genesis, and it says in three days it was Pharaoh's birthday, and he brought forth the chief baker and butler, and he had the chief baker um, dispensed. And then the chief butler was returned um, to service. And Joseph had told the chief butler, remember me, for I am here unjustly. He said, remember me and mention me to Pharaoh when, the, when you are back in his service. But the chief butler forgot about him. But then fast forward and down the road, Pharaoh has a dream that deeply disturbs him. He calls forth all the magicians and sorcerers and men of counsel in the land, and no one can interpret his dream satisfactorily. And so the chief brother goes, wait up, wait up, wait up. He says, I forgot, I made a mistake. There was this Hebrew that can interpret dreams. And the chief brother shares with Pharaoh the story and says, you know, I meant to um, tell you about him and I've forgotten. 
And so Pharaoh immediately has Joseph brought before him. And Joseph says, tell me your dream and I will interpret it. And the dream went that Pharaoh had that he saw seven um, gaunt, skinny cows and seven fat, full, healthy cows. And then the, um, the skinny cows ate the fat cows, but yet they stayed skinny. And then Pharaoh saw seven unhealthy, dying looking ears of grains of corn and seven healthy, full, vibrant, yellow grains of corn. And the unhealthy corn ate the healthy corn, but yet remained unhealthy. And so Joseph said, allow me to interpret this dream for you. He said, in Egypt and the surrounding land, you will have seven years of bounteous harvest. But then following that, you will have seven years of great famine. So Joseph said to Pharaoh, designate one man wise in counsel to overlook all of the goods of Egypt and to set away one fifth of all of the grain for seven years in a storehouse for the seven years of famine. And Pharaoh was just amazed. His interpretation made so much sense that in that moment, Pharaoh gives his signet ring to Joseph, puts on fine linens and gives him a golden chain necklace and says to all of his leaders, he says, Joseph now is second in command of Egypt. He only answers to me. Everyone is to obey Joseph and he will oversee all of the lands. And whenever you have a question, go to Joseph. And so Joseph was raised up as this vicar over all of Egypt. So that's kind of how we get to the story of Joseph. And we also kind of hear right with St. Joseph that he becomes the universal patron of the church, right? Our protector for our faith. We see how the story goes. We know that Joseph successfully set aside the grain. And we know that in the time of famine came and not only affected Egypt, but all the surrounding lands. And who was in those surrounding lands? But the 11 brothers, right, that betrayed Joseph and his father Jacob that he hasn't seen for many, many, many years. His father Jacob that thinks his son is dead. And so one fateful day as Joseph is overseeing the grain storehouses, he recognizes several of his brothers as Jacob had sent them to Egypt to request grain to eat before they starved to death and were to die from the famine. And Joseph um, ultimately breaks down. He um, reveals who he is, their forgotten son, and, and their family reconciles. And eventually um, the entire family is brought to Egypt and Joseph receives his father Jacob and all of his brothers. Um, they're all recognized by Pharaoh. They're all placed in Pharaoh's palace. And um, that's kind of how the story um, wraps up. And of course, there are many similarities there between St. Joseph and, and Joseph of the Old Testament. Um, first off, you know, we already kind of mentioned, you know, how um, Joseph is part of this kind of father of all nations. And, and St. Joseph is the father of Jesus of all nations. And, and now we have, you know, Joseph of the Old Testament that is overseeing the storehouses of grain for all the world. The entire world is coming to Egypt. To, to, to survive, to live, to have of their, their bread. And, and who is Jesus Christ? Who, who is St. Joseph? You know, Bethlehem, the house of bread, you know, and, and the line of David, where the Savior would be born. Joseph, who, who oversaw the Holy Family, who watched over Jesus. Jesus, who would become the bread of life for all nations, for all peoples, all peoples, whoever will be. What a beautiful similarity that both Josephs in the Old and New Testaments oversee that gift of bread. Joseph in the Old Testament that will give us, you know, physical bread to sustain our physical lives. And Joseph in the New Testament through Jesus Christ, his foster son, who will give us the bread of eternal life. So there's these beautiful connections. And just one last little part I'd like to mention on it is the reconciliation of families. Now, of course, I already mentioned this, but it's worth mentioning again during this holiday season, during this Advent season, that's one of those other little penitential things we can consider. Is God calling me to reach out to a family member this holiday season? Is God calling me to pray for a special family member this holiday season? We see the great drama of family life, of jealousy and bigotry and unforgiveness play out in a very radical way in the story of Joseph and his 11 brothers. We see many, many, many years pass in between and much loss and much heartache. 
but we also see restoration and reconciliation. We see great joy and gratitude with many tears overflowing. That's a petition that weighs on all of our hearts, and that's one that we certainly can also offer to the Lord this Advent. All right, we got five minutes left. So we're gonna wrap it up on time. Our last section, Roman numeral six, Joseph and the Old Testament, a type of Christ. Not only are there similarities between the two Josephs, but also between Joseph and the Old Testament and Jesus. Of course, as we saw, Joseph was favored by his father Jacob in the Old Testament. And we know that the New Testament, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan, the heavens apart, the Holy Spirit descends, and God the Father speaks to His Son, Jesus Christ. You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, within whom I delight. So both are favored by their Father. We know that Jesus, in the Gospels, is betrayed by Pontius Pilate for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus, who of course is a, one with the 12 apostles, you know, the 12 again, and there's that betrayal. We saw that Joseph, and the Old Testament was sold by his brothers for 20 pieces of silver. As I mentioned, Joseph in the Old Testament was lifted out of a pit by the traveling caravan. And we know that Jesus would have been in some type of pit or prison the night of his passion. And also in the three days of his death in the tomb that he rose from. Of course, as I mentioned before, Joseph was enslaved in Egypt and Jesus was exiled to Egypt. Joseph resisted temptation, but was falsely accused with Potiphar's wife. And we know, of course, that Jesus was falsely accused in his passion. Joseph tells his brothers he will rule over them. Um, brief recap there. Joseph had a, a premonition, a dream, um, before his brothers had sold him in slavery, that he would rule over um, his brothers. And he told them that, and that was part of the jealousy. And of course, this will was fulfilled in Egypt. But yet, Joseph was hated and despised by his brothers who humiliated him. And we know that the same happened um, to Jesus, that in his passion, um, he was certainly um, despised and humiliated by others. So we certainly can see some um, connections there. And just these last couple of minutes, the last thing I'm going to mention is um, for all you Brant Petrie fans, I do give a disclaimer. He's the, my biggest source of um, research, aside from the Church Fathers. But um, he came out with his latest book. How many of y'all knew that he came out with a new book? A few of y'all? It's a book on spiritual theology. So when I was in seminary, Brant taught us this class. And he always said it was the most anointed thing he ever taught. And the favorite thing he ever taught. And it's actually the only class he ever taught that was not strictly um, scriptural interpretation. But... It's a class on spiritual theology and how to pray. And so he wrote this um, new book. Um, you can take a look at it after if you want. And it's called Introduction to the Spiritual Life. And the part I want to mention to conclude tonight is, and this will be another mission another day, but um, the um, thesis of Brandt's Introduction to the Spiritual Life is the three ways of the spiritual life, the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive way. And Brandt is going to speak about passive purgation. So, um, passive, when we speak about active purgation, we're talking about what I've spoken about in Lent Advent, actively discerning and praying and choosing different disciplines to grow in holiness. We call that active purification or purgation. But passive purgation is accepting your situations in life and the things that you can't control and allowing them to happen, appropriately speaking, that you you know, bad things happen in life, unfortunate things, injustices happen in life, and we can't control them. You know, whether it's a domestic issue or sickness or something related to, you know, employment, whatever it is, you know, things happen in life that can be um, very difficult and, and uncontrollable. But, but yet God allows these crosses in our life, and that experience, technically in spiritual theology, is called passive purgation. And that's what Brandon's going to really dive into that while we may do active purgation, and during Advent and Lent we may actively try to work on different virtues, God ultimately, and our journey with Him throughout the entirety of our lives, 
the greatest um, growth and holiness will be through passive purgation. And in this book, Grant's going to clarify the confusion surrounded around the dark night of the soul. Because um, we hear about Mother Teresa and her 50 years of the dark night, but that's not really the dark night that most of us are called to. Um, through John the Cross, he wrote through two different dark nights, the dark night of the senses and the dark night of the soul. And the dark night of the senses is the transition from the purgative to the lunative way, and the dark night of the soul is the transition from the lunative way to the unitive way. And that's normally, that transition of the dark night happens through passive purgation, or just allowing the situations of life that we can't control to happen with faith, allow that to purify us for heaven. And so, you know, Joseph, when he was sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt, Jesus going through his passion, those crosses, those injustices, are great examples of passive purgation, allowing great difficulties to purify us that we may be pure and, and worthy of heaven. And, and so um, that is something we all are familiar with um, in life, and that's part of the desert experience. So I just wanted to mention that tonight, because we're on the second dream of Joseph and his journey to the desert. And that's one of the other things. And we go to the desert for quiet and solitude. And we go to the desert with the Holy Family of Nazareth to um, be with the Lord and to be able to have our eyes open, our ears open, that we may see and hear the Lord in the quietude, the desert, let go of those distractions of the holiday season. But also, the desert's a time of purification. And the desert's a time of passive purgation where we may have those crosses in life. So if you have a cross in life, just a deeper understanding that God's preparing us through kind of that purgatory in this life of that cross for heaven. And if you want to learn more about that, you know, just grab Brant's book. Um, you can get it on Amazon now. Um, right now you can buy a signed copy. And so I got a few, so those are available um, on Amazon. All right, guys, we're just going to wrap up the glory be, okay? In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Now the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, guys, so I hope we have um, better weather tomorrow night. Thank you all for making it out. Um, welcome back tomorrow night. We'll be diving into Joseph and his role as king. Hope to see you all then. Welcome.